Well, thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you. Although I do note I, I come again at the end of the program after a long day. And I will try to do my best, therefore, to um, make my points clear and to uh, be making the points expeditiously. Some of us can smell that coffee. <clears throat> just in case you hadn't thought of it before. <laughs> this morning, uh, I guess it was this afternoon, it seems like this morning now. Uh, this afternoon, I was trying to sketch in Matthew's gospel through the concept of fulfillment that he uses, uh, a, a broad perspective in which we can understand the relationship of Old and uh, New Testaments. Uh, the sketch was, was very broad in terms of the concept, promise, fulfillment, which is familiar, I'm sure, to all of us. I did try to go into some specifics on the matter of the law as Matthew seems to present it in his Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I would like to pick up from that tonight before turning tomorrow to uh, other issues of Old Testament and the New and pursue the matter within the teaching of Paul a little bit with you. Um, I'm not sure it is at all necessary, granted what John has just given us, uh, nevertheless, uh, I'd like to go through some of the evidence as I see it, grounding my points in various texts, uh, maybe tweak a couple of things here and there that can become points of discussion for us. So I am proposing not tonight ten propositions, but nine, uh, and uh, <laughs> I will spend a little bit more time on some of them than on others. In fact, some can be pretty quickly mentioned. Uh, in order to preserve time for some we need to discuss a little bit further. So nine propositions that in some ways uh, summarize my understanding of Paul's teaching on the law. Uh, one, perhaps self-evident in a group like this, but I find the point needs to be made to my students and to lay people especially, the law in Paul is basically Torah. The law in Paul is basically Torah. Torah, of course, the transliteration of the Hebrew word used throughout the Old Testament and in Jewish literature for the law God gave to his people through Moses. In fact, in my own teaching and writing, I am more and more finding myself using that word Torah precisely because it conveys better the specific entity of which Paul speaks in his epistles. We must remember that as a Jew writing in the context of Paul's life and ministry, the word law inevitably for him is going to have the concrete reference to the law of Moses. Centuries of theological discussion in which the term law is applied particularly, for instance, uh, in Lutheran theology quite broadly to anything in scripture that commands us can obscure that fundamental point from which we must start in interpreting Paul. Yes, I think there are passages in which Paul moves from Jewish Torah to a wider concept of law, and we will look at some of those texts tonight, but we badly misread Paul if we do not understand that his concern in the context of the debates of the first century Christian movement had to do with the continuity, the meaning, the significance of the Old Testament law. Nor then, on the other hand, does Paul's use of the word law normally refer in any sense to the Old Testament canon, in whole or in part. Paul distinguishes law and promise within the book of Genesis. Not all of Genesis for Paul is law, far less Pentateuch or Old Testament as a whole. Again, there are exceptions. We must recognize where Paul can use law on a few occasions in a canonical sense. Uh, Romans 3, uh, 19, for instance, is one of them. There are a few others, but they are only a handful. So when we read Paul's theology of the law, we are really reading his theology of intertestamental relationships at this crucial juncture. Second, second proposition. Again, 
no news to any of you, but it needs to be said because it so easily gets lost in everything else we say about Paul. Second proposition, the Torah is good and holy. Romans 7, 12. It's at this point in Paul's letter to the Romans that he himself is aware that he has said so many negative things about Torah that some people are going to begin drawing the wrong conclusion. They will think they have followed Paul's logic and are ready to sort of jump in with him and agree, Paul, it's clear now, you've made the point, the law is a bad thing. Paul will not have that. And the main function of, uh, of Romans 7, 7 to 12 is to demonstrate Indeed, that the law itself is not sinful. It is, as Paul concludes the paragraph, holy. And the commandment, he says, is holy, righteous, and good. Paul does that to you just when you think you have figured him out. <laughs> he twists things in the argument a little bit, and you're back at square one. The fascination and the frustration at the same time of studying Paul. Third proposition. The Torah does not solve man's plight. It exacerbates it. The Torah does not solve man's plight. It exacerbates it. In the very paragraph in which, as we have just seen, Paul seeks to assert the continuing goodness of the law, the divine origin and holiness of the law, he nevertheless, after framing things in that way, within that paragraph, marshals a case for the tie between sin, law, and death. We won't go in here to the uh, precise experience that Paul might have in mind as he writes these words, I think myself, uh, Paul is identifying in a corporate way with the nation of Israel, and so that ultimately, in verses 7 to 12, Paul is reflecting on the experience of Israel and what happened to Israel when the law was given to that people. But, but quite apart from that issue, which, which I know is significant and debated, uh, the point Paul makes is clear enough. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. Apart from law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. It is not the fault of the law, as John was pointing out uh, uh, ably in his message just before mine. It is sin that has used the law to produce death. God's Torah, as good as it was, as much as it genuinely revealed his will and his person and his purposes, did not itself bring with it the ability to obey. And so in salvation history, Paul argues, the effect of the law has been to make the human situation worse. What at one point was a vague falling short of God's ideal becomes under the law a specific transgression of his revealed purpose. One of my daughters comes in later than she knows she should. She'll get in trouble. If, before she left home, I told her, you be sure to be home by 11 o'clock, and she's not, she gets in greater trouble. So paradoxically, God's law coming to a sinful and fallen people increased, in that sense, guilt and sinfulness. And Paul talks about that a number of times, Romans 5.20. Uh, where he sketches uh, the course of salvation history through the representative heads of Adam and Christ. Uh, he says there in verse uh, 20, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. And here Paul uses the language of purpose, suggesting 
that this function of God's Torah was not accidental, but purposeful. Four, and here I think I'll spend a little bit more time. The Torah is valid for a specific time in salvation history. The Torah is valid for a specific time in salvation history. Here I want to look especially at Galatians 3, classic text on this particular matter. These new Christians in Galatia, you will recall, have been listening to some Jewish Christian teachers. These people purporting to come from the apostles in Jerusalem and therefore to bring a gospel superior and more authentic than Paul's, who after all never saw Jesus in the flesh, have argued that essentially Paul, while a faithful servant, does not quite have his theology together. Essentially they're telling the Galatians, this Paul is a good fellow, he's sincere and dedicated, does some good evangelistic work, but, but he just does not quite have his theology together. Read the Old Testament. How do you become a child of Abraham? It's clear you are to be circumcised, you are to put yourself under the law as the people of Israel did. So it's clear that though you have made this commitment to Jesus as Messiah, to, to validate your position in the people of God, you must now agree to be circumcised, to obey the dietary laws, to observe some of the Jewish calendar, perhaps not every detail of the law, uh, but you certainly have to agree to come under its most basic parts. This seems to have been their message to the Galatians, who were wondering at this point who to believe without uh, a, a New Testament to turn to. And so Paul responds to this false teaching. He makes, of course, a number of different points, but what we want to look at is his argument, especially in uh, chapter 3, verses 15 through 25, which I think is the heart of the theology he wants to uh, convey to the Galatians. And uh, just to kind of preface where I think we're going, uh, I want to argue that it is a thoroughly salvation historical theology. And I'll try to draw out some of the implications of that as we go. He begins by using an everyday example to make his point. Someone who is uh, making a human covenant and has it ratified cannot add or change it once it has been put into effect. So in the divine arrangement, Paul suggests, Verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. By the way, while Paul uses that argument here, uh, seeking to show that, 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 that Jesus Messiah is in some sense the seed, he is obviously not ignorant of the collective sense of that word because he comes around at the end of the chapter, verse 29, and calls Christians generally Abraham's seed. Uh, he makes this point as a strategic move here. Uh, he is not an ignorant of the collective uh, meaning of the word uh, seed. So he goes on, verse 17. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Here, Paul makes a point that might be obvious to us, but would have been a, a telling point to at least some Jews in his day. While most of our sources for this idea are later than Paul's date, uh, parenthesis, be very careful when people argue from Jewish sources. Make sure they give dates or that you can check the dates of the sources. There is far too much bad use of Jewish sources. And even some pretty respectable commentaries uh, 
uh, where they will appeal, for instance, to passages in the Talmud to reveal the background for the teaching of Paul, which is sort of like referring to the current Sports Illustrated as an influence on Shakespeare. <laughs> because in written form, we're aware the Talmud is about 500 years after Christ. Granted, some of its traditions, some of the oral tradition goes back to the time of Jesus and Paul. But you have to know which do and which don't. And if you don't know that, you'd better be very careful about using that material. So just a word of caution. There's a lot of very slippery use of that material. People figure, well, it's so long ago, what's a few hundred years? You know, <laughs> but uh, it, it does make a difference, obviously. So on this particular matter I'm talking about, we, we have a little bit of evidence from Paul's date. Most of it, I must tell you, comes from a later date. Evidence that Jews believed that the Torah was essentially eternal, that uh, it was there from the beginning, uh, that it was part of what God was about and doing in the world right from the start. And so the claim Paul makes here, look, Torah came in 430 years after Abraham. It came in with Moses, is a very important point to make against that possible background of false teaching. By the way, those who argue that law in Galatians 3, therefore, is misunderstood law, uh, uh, have a real problem with this verse, I would suggest to you. You see, that, that, that's one move that's made here. Uh, oh, oh yeah, Paul uh, sets temporal limits on the law or something, but this is the misunderstood law, or the misapplied law, or the wrong interpretations of the law, or, 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 or the ceremonial law only, or, or something of that sort, none of which has any handle in the text, I, I must confess. So, here also I might just add, and this would be an interesting conversation to have with some of you in light of some things John was saying again. Note Paul's use of the word covenant here to embrace all of salvation history. <coughs> Is the idea of a single unitary covenant all that wrong then, rightly defined? I'm sure you are aware better than I am that in uh, what we might loosely call the tradition of covenant theology, there have been various different options taken on where the law of Moses fits in. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were serious debates about these matters among some of the uh, 17th century Puritan divines trying to sort out uh, how within a unitary covenant we can explain this, this, this law of Moses. And some of the explanations given by covenant theologians would come very close to the sorts of views that I'm hearing here in the conference. So just, just you know, something that, that I would enjoy conversing with some of you about at some point. At any rate, you have this, this covenant, Paul says, God has established that moves from Abraham to Christ, that embraces all of salvation history as the basic thing God is doing. That's what he's about. It's a matter of promise. It's a matter of faith. Into this comes the law. But, as Paul goes on and makes clear, the law came for a limited purpose and for a limited time. He asks the question, verse 19, what then was the purpose of Torah? It was added because of transgressions, or I would probably translate for the sake of, or even to produce transgressions. And now note the temporal language here. Until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. It was added. It was not there from the beginning. It came into salvation history at a definite moment in time and was to last until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. I'm going to skip verse, into verse 19 and verse 20. You can read the 200 different interpretations of that verse in some of the commentaries on Galatians. Let's pick things up in 21. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? You see, here's a conclusion one might draw again. All right, Paul, I, I, I think I've got you straight now. You've got the principle of law, you've got the principle of promise, and they're opposed to each other. And just when we think we've understood, Paul again brings us up short. Of course they're not opposed to each other. What's his point? They're not opposed to each other because they have different functions. 
they're doing different things. They can't be contrary to one another in any direct sense. The law cannot give life. No law can. What the scripture does, rather, is declare all things to be a prisoner of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. 23 to 25 now, I think the center of this. Before this faith came, I think Paul's referring here to the specific Christian faith that entered into the world with Jesus. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, NIV, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Three critical points that I want to make here in this short paragraph. First of all, who does Paul mean when he says, we? Point's much debated. Uh, one obvious answer is, well, Paul himself and all the people to whom he writes. We Christians, and obviously the word often has that significance in Paul. I think in this context, however, it might have a slightly different nuance. Set perhaps by the tone uh, of the somewhat programmatic passage 2.15 and following. Here Paul makes a critical distinction. Galatians 2.15. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And then he goes on. Now, I know that context is a little bit far away from where we are now. But uh, I think one can make a consistent argument if we find Paul continuing to use the first plural to refer not to we Christians or we people generally, but to we Jews. I would argue then that these verses are not about the effect of law in the life of people generally. These verses are about Torah in the life of Israel. Second point, the word pedagogos, Paul uses in verses 24 and 25. The pedagogue, we could transliterate. Uh, here Paul draws a term from the Greco-Roman world of his day. There's been some discussion about the precise picture that we are to, to get from this Pythagogos. Some make it a very positive picture in terms of the Pythagogos as a teacher or a tutor, a la King James Version, for instance. But the evidence seems quite overwhelming that the Pythagogos was a, a rather menial person, uh, usually a slave, whose job was to supervise a, a young child. Not to teach the child, the didaskalos, the teacher, was a different person entirely. The Pythagogos was uh, the one who had charge of the child. Some have uh, sought to suggest the idea of babysitter as a modern equivalent. I don't think it's precise, but it might help. Um, guardian, I think, uh, might be a good uh, rendering or supervisor, perhaps. Uh, added to that, then, is the third point. There is a preposition Paul uses in verse 24 that could be either given a purpose sense, the law was our pedagogos for the purpose of Christ, to lead us to Christ, you see, or it could have a temporal significance. Torah was our supervisor until Christ. And I would suggest to you that in this context, the latter is more likely since Paul has already used temporal language in just that way. So in contrast to, to some traditional interpretations that think Paul here is talking about the purpose of divine law, within humanity at large, leading to the conclusion that uh, any faithful church service, such as the, the Lutheran church I grew up in, 
must always proclaim law first in order to stimulate people to repentance. And then you can read gospel to assure them of God's uh, good news to them. It's a concept that I don't have that great a quarrel with in some ways, but I must say I think it is not well based in this text. Paul is not talking about the way God's law operates in the lives of people generally. He is reflecting on what God intended Torah to accomplish for the people of Israel. Implication, obviously, for the Galatians is, why would you want to go back to that period again? That era is over. The Torah had its purpose and its time. So in effect, you see, if you want to go under Torah again, you are saying, well, the seed has not come to whom the promise was given. Messiah is not here. You have failed to recognize the shift in salvation history that John was talking about. Fifth point. Christ is the culmination of the Torah. This is my translation of the much debated Romans 10.4. Paul in this passage is reflecting on the significance and trying to understand Israel's unbelief. In chapter 9, you remember, Paul appeals to God's election as the reason why Jews have not believed and are not being saved. In 930 to 1021, he appeals to their lack of faith, and this is the reason for their falling short of salvation. Side by side in these two chapters, you therefore have the divine sovereignty and the human responsibility. Another subject. But in the course of that, that argument, he, he, he is trying to help uh, his readers in Rome understand why uh, the, 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 the strange event has taken place, that the people of Israel, to whom the promises were originally made, have largely not embraced Jesus, whereas many, many Gentiles who were, were far off in the language of Ephesians have come near and have uh, committed themselves to Jesus as their Messiah. Why is this, Paul asks? Well, one of the uh, explanations is that uh, the people of Israel lacked knowledge. Verse 2. They have zeal, Paul says, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. They did not understand or recognize the righteousness of God, and they have sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Now remember that for Paul, the righteousness of God has been made manifest in Christ. 117, 321. This is, again, a distinctly salvation historical argument. Paul is not saying Old Testament Jews failed to realize that God was righteous. He is saying Jews in his day have failed to understand that God has now revealed his eschatological righteousness in Jesus. And then comes the explanation in verse 4. For Christ is the culmination of the law. End is what we usually translate in English. That translation might be all right, but the problem is the, the, the English word end is very ambiguous. We could say, for instance, uh, at the end of the conference, and we mean when the conference is over, when it's terminated. On the other hand, we could say, but it would be a little probably more unusual in English, the end of the conference is that everybody might praise God more fully. You see, it could have a sense of goal sometimes. But end in English does tend to convey more of a sense of termination, temporal finality. I don't think that is quite what Paul intends with the word he uses here. The word is telos, from which we get telic, purpose. Uh, the word is used in a variety of ways in Paul, New Testament, Septuagint, secular Greek. Uh, so certainly there are several options available when you look at the lexicon. But in this context, what I think Paul is doing is using a kind of race course imagery 
clear particularly from pursuit and attaining in 931 to 32. So the image is this. Israel is running a race, the race of salvation history. Um, and Israel has made the mistake of Saul focusing on Torah, running with her head down, as it were, that she doesn't realize she's crossed the finish line. <laughs> and she's running away, see, just continuing to run, doing Torah, doing Torah, doing Torah. The race, you see, is, is that preparatory period, which was always directed toward and had its product in the finish line. That was the goal. But of course, once that goal is reached, the race is over. So I think the word Paul uses here is a deliberate word that combines the sense of Torah as that which pointed to Christ, the finish line, and now having been reached, the race, the era of Torah is over, you see. If you see a similarity to the view I was arguing this morning or this afternoon on Matthew 5, uh, 17, um, I think you're right on target. I think when boiled down to theological essence, very different context, terminology, and issues being addressed, Matthew 5, 17 theologically is saying almost precisely the same thing as Romans 10, 4. Six. In light of what we've said, this point is going to be perhaps fairly obvious. Christians are not bound to the Torah. Romans 6, 14, you are not under law, but under grace. And remember, that means you are not under Torah. Like John, I've often been accused of being an antinomian. And I always say, which namas are we talking about? Um, and, uh, and Paul's point is, again, we are no longer under Torah. Please don't let uh, young people who, who, who want to be sexually pros promiscuous together use this verse as it's been quoted to me. We're not under law. How could you tell us not to do that? 7.4 is making a similar point. My brothers, Paul says, you have died to the law. The imagery of die to, particularly in light of Romans 6, the parallel died to sin, means no longer bound to, no longer enslaved to, no longer under the strict authority of. Seven. Christians are, however, obliged to obey the law of Christ. Go back to the argument of Galatians for a moment. Throughout the letter, Paul tries to help the Galatians understand that they must not view themselves in any way as under Torah now that the new age has dawned. But an obvious question is going to arise at this point. Some of Paul's Jewish Christian brothers and sisters, I'm sure, raise this issue. And I'm sure Jews raise it as a point uh, of contention against Paul's gospel. Where now is any basis then for morality? How any longer can we direct our lives in ways pleasing to God? If Torah is gone as a directing force, how now do we know how to live? Paul, again, is very sensitive to that issue, and so toward the end of Galatians, that's precisely the point he turns to. Verse 13 of chapter 5. You were called to be free, yes, free from Torah, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. Essentially, what Paul argues at the end of, of Galatians 5 and the beginning of, of, of Galatians 6 is this. We may not have Torah, Paul says, but we do have the Spirit producing from within a life pleasing to God. And two, we do have a law. My daughter hates it when somebody does that, but I'm going to do it anyway. Quotation marks. <laughs> the law of Christ. And you see how that has such a rhetorical significance in light of what Paul has been doing in Galatians. Galatians. 
Throughout the letter, he's saying, not law, not law, not law. Now he says, but we do have a law, the law of Christ. Similarly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's famous um, description of his, his rights and freedom as an apostle and preacher of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 and following. I think this summarizes the, 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 the situation very neatly indeed. Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law. Now I think that's just another way of saying Jew. Because Jews are those to whom Torah has been given. To those under Torah, I became as one under Torah. Note the parenthesis. Though I myself am not under Torah. He wants to make it clear. So as to win those under Torah. When I evangelize Jews, I don't order, order sausage on my pizza, Paul is saying. <laughs> but, but verse 21 to those not having Torah, Gentiles, I became like one not having Torah. And again, a parenthesis, don't get me wrong, Paul says now, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. You, 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 you see the scheme that emerges here then. You have God's law as the all-embracing kind of moral imperative for the people of God. That comes in the form of Torah for Israel, Paul is no longer under Torah, he says, though he may live under it if he chooses for evangelistic purposes. And then you have Christ's law, the law that Paul as a believer now finds himself to be responsible for. Eight. Just when we think things are clear. The law of Christ includes within it, in some fashion, taking up within it and reproducing it, Torah. Here's where I am uh, uh, really not prepared to say much definite because I am uh, continuing to reflect on this matter and trying to, to synthesize the exegetical material as I see it. The picture I just sketched for you, that, that, that neat little diagram, is, is, is logical, it has textual basis, it, it, it makes good sense. The problem is it has to be nuanced. Because the more I read the New Testament, the more I'm convinced that there are places where New Testament writers can quote Torah as if it still were authoritative. Paul himself, Ephesians 6, this is the first commandment with a promise. Honor your parents. Throughout James, we read about the law. Uh, and while I think James clearly reflects to some extent Jesus' reinterpretation of that law in his context and in light of what he says, the law he has in mind is clearly Torah. So this is something I still myself need to be working on. And I apologize for, for not in good conscience being able simply to leave you with that neat diagram I gave you with with everything buttoned down uh, and all verses uh, explained. I think there is a stubborn residue, if I may call it that, of verses in the New Testament that just will not fit that model as precisely as we would like. And I'm not prepared to give up the model, but I am uh, uh, concerned that, that we properly nuance it uh, so that we uh, are not uh, missing uh, some of the richness that we do have in the scriptures. So, we'll have to wait and see on that. Point nine, and finally, the law of Christ, however we have understood that, is a secondary and must never be a primary guide to sanctification. Here's where balance, I think, is very, very much needed. Paul, as we have said, is essentially waging a salvation historical battle. And, and his concern is with, with Torah uh, as the authoritative will of God for the people of Israel 
in the Old Covenant. Now passe with the arrival of Messiah and the inauguration of the New Age of Redemption. At the same time, I don't think we can read Paul without, without, without sensing that there's also not a distaste, but a distancing from law, however we define it. Paul, to put it bluntly, would prefer not to have to use law as a guide for Christian conduct. For Paul, it is the spirit taking possession of a person from within who produces the righteousness pleasing to God. That is the heart of the matter for Paul. And the church is, is constantly, I think, needing to beware of falling into a legalism or if not legalism, a nomism that gives too strong a place to law in the formation of Christian character. Even the law of Christ is not, to my mind, so clearly a body of rules uh, as it is the example and the principles that Christ established as foundational for the kingdom. Again, balance is, is very important on this point. Paul can use law at times, and 1 Corinthians is a great example. A church which is priding itself on its spirituality and yet going off the rails in terms of sanctification, Paul says to that community, uh, you might think you're being led by the Spirit. You might think you have wisdom and that you are these pneumatics who can... Uh, justify the behavior you're engaged in, but let me tell you, this is wrong. God says you must not do that. A man ought not to be sleeping with his father's wife, however spiritual you think that is. So Paul certainly can use law. It is there, and it has an important function for him, but always, it seems to me, a secondary one. If I might just conclude with a very rough analogy, which some airline pilots I know have said isn't even true to life, so take it or leave it. Um, but but let's, let's assume it were like this, for the sake of my illustration. Uh, that a modern uh, jet liner is essentially guided on its course as it comes in for a landing at Allentown Airport or wherever by an onboard computer. Uh, that is, as it were, the guts of the system. That's the primary guidance system. You program that computer rightly and it directs the course of the jetliner infallibly and correctly, whatever the weather might be like. But because that onboard computer can have glitches and problems, you don't see people turning off the runway lights. Those lights are still there to guide the pilot if the computer is not doing its job. And I would suggest that's a rough analogy for Paul's understanding of the relationship between spirit and law. Uh, the spirit is God's gift to us working from within to transform our thinking and our behavior uh, uh, from the inside out. So that as Christians, ideally, I think Paul would say, the Christian is a person who never needs a commandment because the Christian knows from within what to do and how to act in every situation. But because we are sinners, though redeemed, because the old age is still with us, because we are not yet perfected, we can mistake the Spirit's promptings. Our computer might uh, not be programmed as well as it should be, and so God gives us, as it were, those runway lights of his law when we might be stay straying off course in order to, to, to show us, indeed, that there might be a, a problem in the direction we are heading. Let me conclude with just a brief prayer. Our Father, how delightful it is to sit with your word open and to reflect on its meaning. We marvel again at the riches of the revelation you've given us. However long we live, we will never fully understand. Always there will be new things to learn. Always our theology needs 
adjustment, needs an addition or a subtraction. And we pray that we might be the kind of people always open to listen to your word speaking to us. Oh, Father, may we be, may we be saved from the error of confessing the authority of Scripture verbally, but neglecting it in our studies and in our teaching and preaching. May that word truly be an authority for us, challenging, encouraging, continuing its work of programming our thinking that we might have truly and fully the mind of Christ. For his glory we pray.